Over the last several decades, China has been pumping resources into Africa. The country has invested hundreds of billions of dollars across the continent, ranging in everything from transportation and infrastructure to real estate and technology. But many scholars suggest Beijing's true endgame in Africa is not solely financial, but rather political. Let's bring in Grant Harris now. He is the CEO of Connect Frontier. He's also a former special assistant to the president and senior director for African affairs between 2011 and 2015. Grant, welcome. Great to have you with us. Thank you. So, Grant, I touched on it briefly in that intro, but in an ideal world, what does Chinese President Xi Jinping hope to see come out of all the money and resources they are pouring into Africa? What is the end game in the decades to come? I think the economic opportunities are very real, but they're not the whole explanation of why Beijing is so focused on the African continent. President Xi has really been looking to deepen relationships, deepen his influence, show that in his mind, China's model is superior to that of the United States. And I think that what we're seeing here in the depth of what China is doing, because it's not just economic, it's also ties with political ties, military sales, cultural exchanges, even training journalists. It shows that there's a very serious and long-term focus on China's part. And so let's deep dive into exactly what China, which countries China is focusing on, because of course, Africa is a continent composed of, of many different nations, all, not all of uh, which get along with each other. So how are they managing to, to, to pinpoint where they want to develop the most influence? It, well, it really is across the board. You're right that Africa is an incredibly diverse and dynamic continent. There are 54 countries across the continent. The median age is just 19 years old. And this is a young, fast-growing, increasingly urbanized population. And the commercial opportunities will be there going forward. One statistic that really sticks out in my mind is that by 2050, a quarter of the world's population and workforce will be African. And so any companies or let alone country with long-term geopolitical views and ambitions is gonna need to pay all the more attention to these many countries. And China's been doing so across the board. Even after COVID, they've been providing personal protective equipment. They've been trying to restart some of the economic relationships that were on pause and really trying to restart their exports to the continent and, and doing a pretty effective job. So, Grant, where does this leave the United States? National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien recently told a conference of African leaders that the United States is committed to long-term investment and trade in Africa. So what does that look like? And, and how does Washington plan to combat China's growing presence in the region? Or, or does it? Does Washington care whether this is happening? Washington should care. I think under the Trump administration, there's been a lot of criticism of Chinese practices as quite predatory, quote unquote. But the problem is what model is being offered? There's a lot of need for investment. There is a huge infrastructure gap facing the continent. And China is showing up with cash and with deep pockets and is investing in these projects, whereas the United States has been slower and later to the game. Under the Obama administration, we took efforts to move in this direction. President Trump has made some announcements, and I think the shining light, really one of the only positives coming out of his Africa-related policy, is the creation of a development finance corporation. But it needs to punch above its weight. It needs even more tools, more resources, and the U.S. needs to take the continent seriously. Uh, under Trump, his policy has been more characterized by racial epithets than it has been diplomacy or development or really working with African states as partners. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the coronavirus, since you really can't avoid it uh, on any continent. You served as an advisor to President Obama on the ground in Africa during the Ebola crisis. So of course, I'm not comparing the two pandemics, but how would you evaluate you know, the Trump administration's response to COVID-19 in relation? The death knell of Trump's policy in response to COVID-19 has been politicizing it. 
And what we saw in the Ebola crisis was President Obama deferred to the science and the public health officials and really followed the course that they thought would best help bend the disease. And it saved a lot of lives. It prevented a lot of spread of the virus. But what we've seen with coronavirus is President Trump initially downplaying it, but then privately with Republican donors being more candid, making masks a sign of tribal politics and somehow political warfare. And he's not been following the council or, or giving the lead to these public health officials who best know what they're doing. And I, that's what worries me most, because it's not just about the response now. And I think tens of thousands of lives have been lost unnecessarily. It's also about our leadership globally. And it's also about what will happen for future pandemics. So what would you recommend going forward? How can we learn from this pandemic, uh, you know, like you said, to address future pandemics? A lot of the lessons from the Ebola crisis were unlearned, unfortunately, and that included working closely in a bipartisan basis with governors, with the Hill, allocating money to the right agencies, letting them put out the science without political appointees trying to edit it for political purposes. And so I would say the lessons that have really been hit home again are to step back and follow the science. Don't turn masks or opening or reopening into political footballs. Don't play games or politics with vaccines or timelines. All of this reduces trust. And it's really about apolitical messaging, building trust in government, and having the top scientists and health officials put out what needs to happen. And I think at the end of the day, Americans understand that hypocrisy is not a public health doctrine. When you hold super spreader events on the White House lawn, or when you denigrate masks, or when you call uh, Dr. Fauci, these idiots, quote unquote, as President Trump did yesterday. It's not a serious response and it's not one that has the national interest or the lives of Americans at its top of list. All right. Well, Grant Harris, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you.